Good evening and welcome to The Strand. I'm Christina Foxley, Director of, an, of Events, and I'm very pleased to welcome back to The Strand graphic novelists Megan Kelso and Kim Deitch. Megan Kelso is here tonight to discuss Artichoke Tales, the long-awaited graphic novel and family saga spanning three generations and an entire continent. Kelso weaves a moving story about family amidst war. Megan's other work includes a collection of short graphic stories called Squirrel Mother and a weekly comic strip that appeared in the New York Times Magazine titled Watergate Sioux. The Search for Smiling Ed is the latest of Kim Deitch's graphic novels to showcase his obsessive burrowing into the nooks and crannies of vintage American popular culture. Where Deitch's earlier books focused on the earliest days of the animation industry in the Boulevard of Bo Broken Dreams, the history of comic strips, alias The Cat, and vintage movie serials, Shadowland, The Search for Smiling Ed explores the surreal landscape of children's TV shows. Following their presentations, Megan and Kim would be happy to take your questions. We'll have this microphone in the audience, so please wait for it before you speak. They will then sign copies of their book for you, which you can purchase downstairs on your way out of the store. Please join me in welcoming acclaimed graphic novelists Megan Kelso and Kim Deitch to The Strand. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'm going first. Uh, and hi, folks. I'm glad to be here and see you all. Uh, I'm going to show you some stuff in just a second. But before I do that, I just want to put a little plug in for uh, a seminar that I'm doing at MOCA, the Museum of uh, Comic Art, Comic and Cartoon Art, next Monday, uh, June 28th, between 6.30 and 8.30. And I'm going to show people how to draw and write comics, basically, and, uh, you know, some of the tricks of the trade that I've picked up through trial and error. So I hope maybe I'll see a few of you over there. But right now, uh, let me take you through a little bit of this book just to give you an idea of what it's all about. I'm going to be reading from this, so, but that's the best way to do it. Anyway, oh, and I, wa I wanted to show you this before we got started because I'm kind of proud of it. This is a a double fold-out of the Kim Deitch universe that features like a, over a hundred of my characters. And uh, in the back of the book there's a key that tells you who's on first and all that kind of thing. So, this story basically starts out with my recounting of a true anecdote about my younger brother Simon. And it is true too. Around 1973, I was seeing him off on a bus ride from San the San Francisco bus depot to New York City. He wasn't in real good shape, and our friendship was rather strained at the time, so conversation was not coming easily while we waited for the bus. Then, shortly before he departed, he suddenly said, apropos of nothing, Hey, remember that old TV show we used to watch, Smile and Ed's Gang? Did I remember? You bet I did. Smiling Ed was a fat old guy who looked like the original dirty old man. His show was sponsored by Buster Brown Shoes. But even then, we kids could tell that on Ed's show, Buster Brown was played by this weird-looking midget. Ed would tell stories out of a big book that segued into cheesy filmed adventures. I got to admit, they were a big snore, usually about some kid in India. Then Ed would bring on his animal sidekicks. There was Squeaky the Mouse, played by a hamster, and Midnight the Cat, who may have been stuffed. In fact, I'm pretty sure she was. And who only said one word, nice. <laughs> the most remarkable part of the show came when Froggy the Gremlin showed up. He'd materialize on top of an old grandfather clock and proceed to disrupt a comedy lecture of one kind or another. Okay, it was pretty stale stuff. But the action was hot and heavy, and the kids in the audience would scream with delight. But that was another really weird thing. Whenever they showed the kids, it was always the same film shot of the same kids. Anyway, 
After I acknowledged remembering the show, my brother said, You know, I heard that when Smiling Ed died, his body was never found. He went on to say that apparently Smiling Ed died on the water in some kind of a boating accident. I think I might have made some lame crack at that point about Froggy pulling Ed under the sea, but I'm really not sure, because suddenly it was time for the bus to go, and I never did hear the end of that story. The next time I saw my brother, he was married and owned his own house in Westchester County. His odd remark about smiling Ed had stayed with me, though, but when I brought it up, he had no memory of ever saying it or even ever hearing of such a thing. Well, it sure got me thinking more about Smiling Ed. The thing is, regardless of whether or not his body was ever found, here indeed was a truly disappeared personality. After Smiling Ed died in 1954, the show left the air, only to reappear about a year later as Andy's gang hosted by Hollywood fat man Andy Devine. But, outside of some new footage of Devine, it was the same old show recycled. Same tired old adventures, same midget Buster Brown, same midnight Squeaky and Froggy the Gremlin, even the same damn shot of the same damn kids, same damn everything except for Smiling Ed himself. Today, if the show is remembered at all, it is usually in its reincarnated format as Andy's gang. Well, it occurred to me that if I could find out a little more about Smiling Ed, there might be a good yarn in it. But poking around, I discovered that absolutely no Smiling Ed shows were available on the video market. Andy's gang? Yes. Smiling Ed? Forget it. At the Billy Rose Library, I did find pictures. And what pictures? Also some reviews of shows, and just the sketchiest amount of biographical data. Ed was born in Georgia and got into the new medium of radio around 1922. So he was already a longtime veteran kitty show host in 1950 when he took a flyer in the newer medium of television. And finally, tantalizingly, he did die in 1954 of an apparent heart attack on a cabin cruiser he owned. He did die on a boat. But that was it, or almost it. There was one other little pearl of information. One of his obits did mention that a memorial was held at something called the Buster Brown Museum at 119 East 36th Street in New York City. I decided to check it out. What I found was a beautiful turn-of-the-century brownstone just off Park Avenue. But the weird geek guarding the place was neither helpful or friendly. Nobody named Buster Brown live here. You go away! Just on a hunch, I asked at a nearby comic book store if they knew of any sort of Buster Brown museum having been in the neighborhood. Well, the kid behind the counter knew nothing and cared less. But the owner was friendlier and was actually fairly helpful. It turned out that Smiling Ed Comics produced as a promotional giveaway by Buster Brown Shoes in the 1950s, are fairly collectible. The TV show's dull adventure segments were drawn in the comics by Reed Crandall, truly one of the all-time great comic book artists. What's more, the guy had heard stories of a Buster Brown Museum at 116 East 36th Street, too, and it even looked into the possibility of opening his store there. But the building turned out to be not for rent at any price. And as I was leaving excuse me, and as I was leaving the building, he let fly with a parting shot. Apparently, the building had the reputation in the neighborhood of being haunted. 
Later, I heard that the Armenian embassy moved in there, and recently, I actually managed to finally get inside the place. But they never heard of Buster Brown, keenly resented my suggestion that the place might be haunted, and were quite firm in requesting that I leave at once. And so, once again, the search for Smile and Ed seemed just about as dead as Ed himself. Or was it? Now, in part two, my cartoon demon cat character, Walter, takes over as the story's narrator. Listen, if Deitch has been crapping out in the story department in the last few years, it ain't my fault. Hey, I gave him plenty of ideas. Check this out. A faggot cyborg monster is jerking off in the New York City Reservoir. If it comes, nearly every man and woman and child in New York will get AIDS. Meanwhile, I'm in my Manhattan penthouse having absolutely safe sex with Sigourney Weaver. But hey, when duty calls, I'm ready. In a high-tech robot of my own design, I kick major butt. In the climactic battle is fan fucking tastic, but way too cool for Deitch. So then, I gave him rap and rastus, totally up to date. In this one, I would have played an African American homeless guy with two fists of iron and the mystic soul of a poet. In it, me and a million black men overthrow America's enslaving power structure. After offing a few ringleaders, we make them into slaves and abolish the income tax. Totally visionary. But did he give it a chance? Hell no. He'd just sit moping like I wasn't even there, trying to work up some fucked up nostalgia story about a fat old TV star from the year one. Then, one day, about a year ago, I saw him in an upscale comic book store over on Park Avenue. Predictably enough, he had his nose in some moldy old comic book. Poor old Deitch, the old Dobbin of comics. Hell, I could put him onto better stories than that, right here in the old naked city. I only bump into him every day. Take that day, for instance. Waldo, long time no see or what? Huh? Chandra, what a kick in the head seeing you after all these years. How long has it been? Oh, 50 or 60 years easy, I'd say. Hey, toast your bones on some of this. Hey, not bad. Where do you get this stuff? Oh, hell, we got boxes of it around the corner where I'm working. Go ahead and finish it. So what are you doing with your face in that comic book store window? I heard you was in comics. Yeah, some second raider was drawing stuff with me in it. In fact, that's him right over there. No shit! Great guy, huh? Walks by like he don't even... Hey, I've seen that guy. He was nosing around the building I'm working in. Over on East 36th Street. Yeah, me and a bunch of the old gang were over there haunting the place. Yeah? Soft job, too. Hey, why don't you come over? Come on, it'll be a regular old home week. And it's true. Waldo runs into a whole bunch of his demon pals from hell over there. There's a good deal of friendly badinage between them all as they get reacquainted. Boy, oh boy, they're still the sweetest bunch of cuties this side of hell. Yeah. Speaking of which, what are you guys doing out of hell? Well, uh, you see, uh, this place was some kind of museum. Yeah, the Buster Brown Museum, and, and we're guarding it till the guys that hired us can get this Buster Brown stuff out of here. Oh, yeah, that's smiling it. We